Okay, welcome to the Bible says what? Well, we're gonna do something a little different tonight. I know y'all don't see me, but God's will, you hear me. Uh, we got uh, Elder uh, Greg Roberts, and he's gonna be bringing a lesson tonight, and I'll be in the background trying to read my Bible. We got power outages over here, so <laughs> uh, we're gonna make it do what it do. One thing about it, we got our Bible, so I'm gonna find a light as he teach. I'm gonna turn it over in his head, and he'll pray. And uh, uh, we in his hand right now. Elder Greg. Welcome, everybody. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear kind Father, we love you and we praise you. Thank you for all those who are listening and who will join God and those who um, would be detractors. God, we pray now your blessings upon all of us tonight. And we pray now, God, that you would bless our time together. Give us uh, thought and give us uh, the word that we should deliver tonight and God bless our time together and that uh, all things will work together for the good. So keep the power going and the lights on and while we have this uh, time together, we'll Amen. thank you and we will praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, we want to talk to you a little bit tonight about uh, the doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of salvation. Um, there's a lot of information. One of the doctrines of uh, salvation we will find in what was called in systematic theology is soteriological or soteriology. So you have the soteriological views that can help us uh, organize our thoughts all the way through the Bible. One good thing about soteriology is that you can use the whole Bible to express what God is going to do uh, for us from the past to the present and to the future. So all of those things. Now we can start out um, in our Bible. Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter number three in Genesis chapter number three uh, we see uh, what God uh, is doing now um, in chapter number three we find here's an interesting by now um, Adam and Eve have messed up and ate of the forbidden fruit right so in that, the judgment has um, come about and everybody has blamed who they want to blame. <laughs> so um, God comes to Adam in chapter number three and he asked the question, you know, to the man, where are you? And, you know, they begin to blame each other. And he said, well, she, uh, she gave me uh, the fruit and I ate it. So from that standpoint, God knew that a decision had to be made for how to deliver man out of the condition that Adam placed all men in. Adam becomes our federal head because Adam sinned that made the whole world, it thrust the whole world into sin. But God had a remedy. You know, the Bible also says that before the foundations of the world, that Christ was already crucified. God had already made a way of escape for man. But listen what Genesis chapter number three uh, says. And uh, verse number 14, the Lord is talking. And interestingly, the Lord says to the serpent, he's talking to the serpent now. Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock. I'm reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. Above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field and on your belly shall you go and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. 
So uh, we can see that the uh, wheels of motion have already been placed in that at some point God was going to have to deal with the sins of the world. And from Adam's standpoint, from the serpent's standpoint, from Eve, and all the way down to you and I. All of us was going to have to bear the burden. Even Adam, even Eve, all of them come under a level of judgment. But he said, I will put a difference or enmity between, uh, or in other words, hostility between you and uh, her. You, between you and and the woman between your offspring and her offspring. So God begins early. Um, so the, one of the most interesting things about Genesis chapter number 3 and verse 15, that it is never quoted like this in the Bible again. Never, never quoted. A lot of verses in the Old Testament has been quoted, but Genesis 3.15 is one of those scriptures that we, a lot of, uh, ones would say that maybe Genesis is fulfilled at, um, how can we say, uh, either at Calvary or it will be done in the millennial reign. I'll let the scholars argue that out about when uh, Jesus dealt Satan his blow. So, but we can see that God began to exercise authority over Satan real early in the game, real early. Let him know that you will be defeated. And uh, so it goes, now it's interesting because when you deal with soteriology, everything comes out of the reason for sin. Sin has to be dealt with. And who has the power to deal with sin but God? His son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit will assist in working all of those things out together. So, you know, uh, I like to ask the question sometime to uh, some of my friends. And here's the question I, I, I like to pose. I said, when it comes down to um, the payment uh, of, of sin, and we kind of get that uh that, that word agarazo, uh, the basic meaning of that word is to buy or acquire. Uh, a, a payment has had to be made. So I, I, I said this, uh, uh, Elder Anderson, uh, who was the payment made to? God or Satan? <laughs> Satan had us bound. Mm -hmm. Sin bound us to trouble. It bound us to the ways away from God. Who was the payment made to? Satan or God? I say God. Yes, sir. I believe you are 100% right. <laughs> Satan ain't gonna never let you go. But God will release you by your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, when Jesus, so you get that word agarazo, uh, one of the ideals inside of uh, purchase, you uh, or buying. The buying comes from, uh, here's an example of buying. Remember in Matthew 13, 44, uh, and, and, and Matthew writes like this. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man, when a man is found, which a man found and hid again. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buy that field. That's powerful. That's powerful. Now, that's how the, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. And aren't you glad that uh, Jesus bought our salvation? He purchased our redemptive price. He, he bought us back from being uh, under Satan's command. And another scripture you can look at is St. Luke chapter 9 and verse 13. 
uh, you, you remember the, the narrative about Jesus feeding the uh, Luke 15. Uh, no, chapter 9 and verse 13. Luke 9 and 13. So he says, but he says to them, you have, you give them something to eat because uh, these people had been with Jesus for a while. And the ideal was they had gotten hungry. And the disciple Jesus says, give them something to eat. And they says, we ain't got but a few denarius. And, you know, we can dismiss this crowd and they can go get them own self something to eat. <laughs> but no, Jesus was trying to build their faith. And he says to them, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless uh, perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. So that's, again, the word agarazo, to go out and buy. So um, it, the, the meaning is to literally have a purchase. So the soteriology or the soteriological view of the use of the word agorazo in the New Testament includes three basic things. is Christ's work of redeeming uh, and, and Christ paid the purchase price for all mankind. He paid the price for all mankind. So you say, where in the Bible will I find that at? So in 2 Peter chapter number 2, we're going to be moving around in a few scriptures here. And so hang with us, and uh, we'll see if we can keep you abreast to what's going on. All right? So uh, 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 1. But the false prophets also arose among the people, just as it as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, who bought them, bringing swift destruction up on themselves. Now, again, uh, denying the master who bought them. Agarazzo, the purchase. He's purchased um, the redemption, the price. And what did he use as the price of the payment. He used his own blood. He used his own blood. He purchased. You find that in the book of Acts. He purchased the church with his own blood. The blood of Christ. Also in the book of Revelations. Chapter number 5. And verse number 9 and 10. It says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God. You know, did you did you catch that? Mm -hmm. They were purchased for God with your your blood, men from every tribe, tongue, and people and nation, and have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Wow, did you catch that? You were slain and purchased for God with your own blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. That's the redemptive price that God submitted. He did not, it was just not his death, but it was also the shedding of his blood. He purchased us with his own blood. Because we have been bought with that purchase price, here's the responsibility that we are to serve him. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't shed his blood just to say, okay, you have the right to be saved, but there is a responsibility. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19 and 20. Listen what it says. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You have been bought with a price. Therefore, therefore glorify God in your body. Because you've been purchased, because you've been bought with a price, what was that price? The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So it teaches us, again, that he was a human. He's 100% man, and also he's 100% God at the same time. That's the doctrine that is taught over in the book of Philippians, chapter number 2. So um, you see being uh, purchased. So inside, that's one that has to be considered inside of soteriology is the doctrine of our souls being purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now let's go to another word, just something interesting um, that can be used also inside of soteriology. The other one is called agorazo. The ideal is the purchasing out of of something you're being bought out of we coming out of the world right so let's go to the book of galatians chapter number uh three so in galatians chapter number three and around about verse number um 12 well let's go to verse number uh 11 now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteousness, but for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Here it is. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written... Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So Jesus became our ransom or our redeemed purchased possession. He's become the one who rescues uh, us from loss or from sin, right? So uh, it improves our opportunity of having a chance to be now called justified, of God justifying us by faith. So when he redeems us, this payment of price uh, is to recover us from the power of Satan, right? So when the, the metaphor is here, Christ is redeeming us or freeing us um, from the dominion, not only of Satan, but the dominion of the law, even the Mosaic law. He's freeing us with the price of his vicious death. They beat him unmercifully. And this is why Isaiah talks about in his uh, writings that his visage was marred more than any man. They beat him until he was almost unrecognizable. So, um, but this purchasing is a very powerful thing that we have been redeemed and how God did it, he was hung on a tree and cursed is every man who's hung on a tree, but Christ was in our stead as our substitute. That's where we get the word propitiation from, right? We find that over in the book of 1 John. So also in chapter of four of the book of Galatians, he talks about here uh, in chapter 4 that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now that's powerful. That he might redeem us. That he might redeem us. How many glad that Christ redeemed you? Amen. I am ecstatic because uh, notice uh, the verse above that and one of the most powerful texts in the book of Galatians, he said, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem, here it is again, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. He's getting us from underneath the law getting us out of sin, his precious blood, his precious blood. Now, let's hold that and let's go to the book of, uh, I think it's 1 Peter chapter number 1. And 
uh, Brother Peter. Yes. In verse number uh, one, he says, And Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Isn't that profound? Yeah. That Jesus Christ, uh, that we were made or we are being in the process of sanctification through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's still happening today. It was just not a one-time uh, event, even though it happened one time, but it has a lasting effect. So uh, for the sprinkling of his blood. So listen, listen what Peter says in verse number three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's powerful. That you have been caused to be born again. What caused us to be born again? If Jesus did not rise again from the dead, then uh, 1 Corinthians 15 said we are of all men most miserable. We're just wasting our time sitting around doing absolutely nothing worth doing anything. If Jesus did not rise from the dead. So one of the controversies is when we look at uh, the resurrection of Jesus is did he raise from the dead physically? There's some said, no, he only raised from the dead spiritually. He don't have a natural body. Yes, he has a natural body. And you can see him having a natural body. The Bible said he was seen by the apostle, by the 12, above 500 men. And then Paul said, at last, he was seen of me. He was seen of me. So he was seen by many of the brethren. And, um, and after, even after that, you know, when uh, Peter and the boys was out fishing and Jesus uh, came to the seashore and had fish waiting on the boys when they came. He had fixed dinner and sat down and ate with them. And if he was rose spiritually, you would never be able to see him. Isn't that something? You would never be able to see him if he rose spiritually, but he rose with a natural body. Listen, I heard a very powerful um uh, bishop right here in the city of Detroit. Now he's going on to be with the Lord. I, I'm not going to call his name, um, but it, he was preaching one Easter Sunday morning and he said, you know, uh, baby, uh, Jesus could have, uh, they could have left that body right there on the cross to rot because he didn't need that body anymore. Now I was shocked to hear him say that. I was shocked, but I know men to, yet today that feel like, but that's just a bad hermeneutic, and I know why men use that as a catalyst, because um, in the oneness uh, a position is that uh, Jesus uh, got to go back to being the father. He cannot be the son anymore. So his sonship was um, only for a space of time, but no, Jesus' sonship is eternal. It is eternal. And I, I, I would like to wrap it tra trail just for a moment uh, on that to prove that his sonship is eternal. And when you go uh, to the book of Hebrews and he talks about uh, thy throne, O Lord, is forever. Right? Mm -hmm. So in, in the book of Hebrews chapter number one, in verse number five, well, let's start at verse number four. It says, having become as, as much superior to the angels and has a name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. 
For which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Mm. And verse number seven, and of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and ministry uh, ministers of flame of fire. But here it is in verse number eight, but of the son, he says, capital S, son, your throne, O God, is forever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companion. With God says his throne is forever, brothers and sisters, all we got to do is accept the word of God. Mm -hmm. To tell me that Jesus' throne or his sonship is temporary, and one of the choice scriptures that they would like to use is in the first Corinthians uh, chapter 15 when the, uh, the Bible says that he's going to deliver up the kingdom to God that God might be all in all. Mm -hmm. They said that's the end of his ministry. Mm -hmm. No. No, God said right here in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 8, God says of, to his son, your throne, O God, is forever. Your throne is forever. Ever. And because his throne is forever, even when we get to heaven, we will recognize the Lord God from glory. The Lord from glory. And so Paul is declaring that the believers have been completely removed from being under the law. <laughs> so Egarazo clearly. And that's what that word agarazo means, to be completely removed mm -hmm. or um, purchased from under the law. Mm -hmm. That's what the word agarazo means. So um, <laughs> in passing, we might note uh, an interesting use of this, um, this passage. In the book of Ephesians, um, he talks about making the most of your time because the days of uh, are evil. But in the King James Version, it said, redeeming the time. The purchasing of time because the days are evil. Mm -hmm. So uh, when God purchases us, uh, again, Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 5, that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. We can't just slide by that passage. It's too powerful. Mm -hmm. So when we look in Galatians chapter number five, four and verse number five, it should make us consider a few things. The reason God sent his son is twofold. Again, the reason he introduces in order that in order that um, he came to redeem. Mm -hmm. And then those who were under the law. So chapter 4 and verse number 4, uh, God, he talks about, um, uh, let me just go back up and grab it right quick, 4 and 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Then hear it again, to redeem those who were under the law. So he was not standing out from the law, but he was born under the law to redeem those who were <laughs> under the law. And so the ideal is not only are we redeemed from the law, but for those who were under the law. Who were under law? The Jews? You had proselytes? Many men, and even he's buying back people who today want to drag us back under the law. <laughs> you can tell, you can tell all the the the, the, Hebrew uh, the Hebrew Israelites. No, a price has been paid. I don't have to cheat the law. Excuse me, yes, sir. 
I, I don't see it here, but over there, they over there fighting y'all already. But they I didn't want to say that. I said, let him keep teaching. Yeah. <laughs> At least you got him listening. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, he's going to redeem us from underneath the law. Now, it, that's hard to... Now, if you want to fight, um, you have to fight with the Apostle Paul. Hmm. These are not my words. This is not my theology. This is, I can just read the text. Amen? Amen. So, uh, in the Mosaic system, so, from the slavery of the Mosaic system, you're bound to it. You can't get out. Not unless God gets you out. You don't have the power to save yourself. You don't have the power. You need a savior. Who is Christ the Lord? You know, we sing, you know, we sing on the Easter, uh, you know, uh, God sent his son into the world uh, that uh, to redeem us from our sins. That's the reason why Jesus came. And not only that, now when he talks about uh, bringing us under the adoption and that giving us full rights and privileges as being a son of God. Right? So that becomes just imperative that, and because, in verse number six, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer slave, but a son. And if a son, then you are heir through God, because what God has done for us. Now, there's an objection. Uh, I'd like to hear it, you know, because a lot of the uh, Hebrew Israelites uh, would love us to, would love to keep us slave to the commands of the law. But Jesus said, I come to get you from underneath the law. Now, that's how we understand. Now, in, in soteriology, that's what the word agorazo means lends itself to. Then there's another um, word. It's called papir popomii. And that's the atonement. You find that in the book of um, Acts chapter number 20, verse 28. He says, be on guard for yourself, for all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer to the shepherd of the to the shepherd, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. What is all this purchasing? <laughs> what is all this that's going on? Where do we be in? Um, what is the atonement for? We can see, remember in, uh, in the baptism of John, you know, he says, um, blessed is he who comes to take away the sins of the world. Now, in the Old Testament, that was Yom Kippur. Kippur means to, you know, cover it. Now God said, I'm not covering sin anymore. Now I'm going to do away with it. Mm. I'm getting rid of the sin problem, and I'm going to make you a son of God. Now you don't have to keep the demands of the law to try to be righteous. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. So now you can come in and and, and notice, uh, brethren and sisters, he says, be on guard for yourself. You don't have to allow nobody to drag you back under the law for righteousness. For our righteousness is in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. He said, be on guard for yourself for all of the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer to the church of, of uh, to the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So the ideal uh, is to keep yourself or acquire or gain possession of. The ideal is that God has acquired the church through the blood of his own son. That's how he did it, through the blood of his own son. He did not uh, run a negotiation about please let my people go. No, when Jesus shed his blood, it redeemed those who would 
exactly put their faith in him. So the ideal is a price paid for a, uh, it is, it's very prominent. The price has been paid. And that price clearly was paid by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, but there is a new, there's another word inside of soteriology. And it's called lutro. Um, and it's uh, to loose. The word for like loosing your clothes and, you know, uh, getting out of something, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually connected with the word ransom or being paid as a condition of release. Mm -hmm. And when God releases us, you got a receipt. <laughs> I've been born again. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, 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 I got this. I got his spirit living on the inside mm -hmm. of me, right? Mm -hmm. That's how God gets you out. You are loose from the law, mm -hmm. from the demands of the law. Today, if I if I choose to believe in Jesus Christ, according to uh, Hebrews chapter number four, mm -hmm. and and uh, I don't keep the Sabbath, uh, you can't stone me. Yes, sir. You know, Elder, I was thinking as you were talking, and when it took my mind back to the slaves, now they couldn't go nowhere not even from one plantation to the other. No, sir. Unless they had this paper by the... Signed by the previous <laughs> yeah. owner. So I'm thinking of it like what you right. said. <laughs> yes, sir. You got to have... Listen, because I don't care where you go in life, somebody got power over you. Mm -hmm. You ain't never free. <laughs> You're not free. If you got a job, you certainly ain't free. Mm -hmm. Right? That's right. That's right. If you go to church, mm -hmm. you're not free. You... <laughs> Our bodies belong to God. Mm -hmm. That's what we read over in 1 Corinthians, mm -hmm. that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We are God's workmanship, right? Mm -hmm. We belong to God. And if you don't want to belong to God, guess who you're going to belong to? <laughs> if you don't want to be in Jesus' church, mm -hmm. there's no other options. You're going to have to stay with the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, And you say, no, no, I'm going to keep the law. No, no, no. The price has been paid to redeem us from the law. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to be redeemed from the law, mm -hmm. then you got to stay with the opposite. <laughs> and it's a heavy price to pay. Yeah. So yeah. when we are released, the receipt of the ransom, the purchase that has been made. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot um, that can be uh, said in, inside of um, Lutro because now I, I'll give you this. Okay, let's go to St. Luke chapter 24. Let's dig into how God delivers. How God delivers because again uh, uniformly the release of receipt of a ransom paid the word was often used in a relationship to the redemption of slaves and prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. All right? What verse did you say? Uh, so I'm in St. Luke chapter 24. Uh -huh. At verse 1. At verse 21. Oh, 21. Okay. Yes, sir. And we may be able to slide a little higher there. So Luke uh, 24. <laughs> All right, let's go to verse number 18. 18 okay. You know, this is the conversation that Jesus is having with those two men who was walking from Emmaus. Mm -hmm. And verse 16, listen what it says. But their eyes were kept from being racked, from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk. And they stood still looking sad. One of them named Cleophas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who do not know, who does not know the things that has happened there these days? And he, Jesus said, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, 
word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hope that he was the one to redeem Israel, to buy her out. Where was he buying her out from? The law, slavery. He was the one. We thought he would be the one. And, and then he says, and yes, and beside all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed when the tomb early this morning, and they didn't find this body. But later on, my brother, uh, when Jesus, uh, in verse number 25, we'll skip down to verse 25. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow to heart to believe that the, all that the prophets have spoken. Ah, ah, so the prophets have been talking about this, huh? Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning him. So they drew near to the village where they were going, and he acted as he was going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us. But, you know, and it goes on, but Jesus unfolded to their understanding all that the prophets been talking about. So, so Elder, so, and the, the person over there on the other side, and I ain't going to call their name, but anyway, they were saying, and I'm not even sure he was a Hebrew Israelite, because even though the Hebrew Israelites are all, yeah, I, I you don't really find them to say that Jesus didn't exist. They, right. they, they talk about the name, so I don't know who he was, but he was posting a lot of stuff. But then my but my point is, you, based on what you read here, that means that you couldn't believe the, the the scripture, which was the Old Testament. Right. If he didn't exist, you got to say that the Old Testament is wrong. Yeah, you got to throw the whole Bible away. Yeah, because again, we started out uh, with the ideal of Genesis three fifteen mm -hmm. that Satan was going to bruise his heel but I'm going to crush his head. Mm -hmm. Now we got to find out what the rest of the Bible now is going to dictate to us. Here's what, here's what Moses says. He said, a prophet like unto me, God's going to raise up. Mm -hmm. Jesus came in the flesh, mm -hmm. just like uh, Moses, mm -hmm. like it unto him. Listen, the whole book of Isaiah is a great exposition. Mm -hmm. And Isaiah wrote in many passages, about somebody coming mm -hmm. that was going to deliver God's people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 55, mm -hmm. Isaiah uh, is all through there, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 14. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of testimony of Israel, the nation, the national deliverance of Israel. Mm -hmm. Notice what Titus says, Titus, Titus chapter number 2. Watch what Titus says. Mm. You have it. Go to Titus chapter number two. Okay. Verse number 11. All right. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Mm. In, in, in teaching or training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, to live, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who was zealous for good works. Uh, didn't that bird just call him God? Yes, sir. Okay. Our Savior and <laughs> God. <laughs> Our God and Savior, <laughs> Jesus Christ. So either way you either way you <laughs> twist it. Either way you turn. Amen. So he wanted us to declare these things. Listen to verse 15. Declare these things. Exhort. Rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. 
No one can disregard me for standing on, on the word of God. You have to see God. God said, let no one disregard you. No you one. Problem see him. You got a problem, you got to see God. And now notice, back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18 and 19. How he redeemed us. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things. Hmm. Like silver. Hmm. Gold. From your futile ways of life. <laughs> inherited from your forefathers. You can't, you can't take a passed on tradition hmm. from the law. And say this is how I'm going to be saved. This is how I'm going to be righteous. He said, but verse 19, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Why was the blood of Christ submitted to redeem us from underneath the law and to cleanse us from all of our sins? He gave himself for us. It has, now, the question is, you know, that, you know, we go back to Acts chapter number one and, and, and the, the question of the uh, Israelites back in that day, when and will, what time will you re, uh, restore the kingdom of Israel? So I say, not now. No, I'm, I, I'm not done with Israel, but right now, uh, Israel, whoever's going to be saved has got to do it individually. God is not dealing with Israel as a whole at this particular time. We sang a song over in, in the church where I was a child. We're crossing over one by one. <laughs> one by one. Yeah. You can't get in on Abraham. You can't get in on Isaac. You can't get in on Jacob. You can't get in on the Sabbath. You got to receive Christ. Right? You got to receive him. Especially in the latter references of the understanding of Lutros, the price paid is the blood of the lamb. And, and Elder, and I'm, as I'm thinking of it, even when Jesus was, was walking the earth, you're seeing him one here, one there. Yes, sir. And then even after he, uh, 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 I don't want to say, uh, after he, after he um, asc ascended, uh, ascended, and from what he taught the apostles, you see one yes, sir. by one. Sometimes you may got a household. Yeah. Right, right, right. right. Cornelius. But it ain't the nation. Right. Right. And he would he got the satirian woman, the Sophonician woman. Picked up her. You know, he's saving everybody. He's not he's not prejudiced. So listen, let's go to Matthew chapter number twenty Matthew and verse twenty eight. Matthew 20 and 28. Very powerful uh, text. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So, uh, verse 27, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 27. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Mm -hmm. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve <laughs> And give his life a ransom for many. He's not going to be my servants. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You don't have to go. No, you're the one that's supposed to serve. <laughs> not have even served if it's serving you. These even might serve in you. You got to serve. Amen. You got to serve. And Mark 10, 45 says the same thing. Son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And that's his, that's his job. Mm -hmm. That's his job. So um, now when you go back to St. John, you go to John chapter number one. It's very profound. John 1 begins to talk about the light and uh, verse number uh, 
verse number three, all things were made through him and without him. This is talking about Jesus because in verse number one, it's in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Then in verse number uh, three, he said, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not that light. That was talking about John. But he came to bear witness about that light. Mm -hmm. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Watch verse number 12. He's talking about the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Not Sabbath day keepers, not law bearers, but to those who would become his own. Right? That's right. To become the children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But of God. Mm -hmm. And they already had the law. Yeah. <laughs> that what they... Well, if you had the law, what was need for Jesus to come? <laughs> if that was going to be it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, there was, if there was no such thing as um, having the law and then... Uh, Everything was set, and all everybody got to do is just keep, keep it, keep it, keep it. It's amazing because when you look at the Sabbath, especially in the book of Genesis, it's very interesting. In the book of Genesis, it is only assumed that God expected everybody to keep the Sabbath. You have no written record from chapter number three that when, when God says, uh, uh, and, and, and he rested on the seventh day, and he rested, from all his labor. He never told nobody to keep that day holy. Never. Not in Genesis. You don't have one record. You don't have no record of the Sabbath being kept in the book of Genesis. Only do we find the Sabbath being, uh, being instituted after, remember God told Abraham in Genesis that 400 years your people is going to go into slavery. And when they come out, I'm going to bless them. When Israel came out of slavery in Egypt, Exodus. in the book of Exodus, Moses was the deliverer. The first thing God gave his people was rest. That's the whole ideal of Sabbath, rest. God wanted his people to rest. Take a day off. You can sleep. You can just snore all day. And you know why he did it? Because Pharaoh worked the people of God from sun up to sundown seven days a week, 365 days a year, never gave them a day off. And the first thing God gave his people was rest. <laughs> and, and, and Elder, we don't see no work like that before Pharaoh. You don't. <laughs> and you don't see it pretty much after you. <laughs> you don't you don't see it. So what God what God was doing now the, the word, the, the Sabbath have increased in uh, its understanding. Now, you go from man taking rest, and then God instituted, I want your beast to have rest. Mm -hmm. Not only your beast to have rest, your land should have rest. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So it was a, a day, then it was a year, mm -hmm. then every, every seven years. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much uh, how much of the Sabbath is expected of us? Mm -hmm. Our culture is completely different today. Mm -hmm. Completely. Mm -hmm. Now, when we rest, because the whole ideal of the Sabbath was not so much religion. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's based upon God giving his people rest and comfort. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. 
He just simply that. And he told us it was a sign. Yes. Yeah. And now when you go and you understand, uh, let, let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke 1. And I'm going to wrap it up here. Luke chapter number 1 and verse 60. Oh, uh, let's see here. Sixty-seven, verse sixty-seven, and he says this: Luke chapter one and verse sixty-seven. And this is John, uh, John's father, and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, "Blessed be the Lord God of Israel." For he has visited and redeemed his people. What did he redeem his people from? What? How was he going to redeem his people? And verse 69, and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all those who hate us to show mercy promised to us of our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. And you will go before the Lord and prepare his ways. Now he's prophesying about his son. But it's interesting that he come to redeem us. Mm -hmm. If the law kept us right, holy, and special, then why did God send Jesus? Mm. Why? <laughs> why would God have to send Jesus if the law kept us holy, pure, and, 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 and justified in all those things? You know, Elder, it, it, and I mean, I can't say I talk to everybody in the world, but I'm just talking about from those that I talk that want to talk about the law. I'm yet to find one that's saying that they're keeping it 100%. They all say they trying to keep it. Yeah, I got I got two uh, the, I got two commands that can't nobody keep. <laughs> I got two. One was to Adam. Mm -hmm. Don't eat of that tree. Mm -hmm. That tree ain't even available for nobody to even try to eat. <laughs> so that's another commandment you can't keep. Mm -hmm. God told uh, Noah, mm -hmm. build me an ark of shittim wood. There's no need for no more boat. Mm -mm. God said the next time I come, it's going to be by fire. Mm -hmm. And nothing you can make is going to rescue you from me. Mm -hmm. Right? So what you're saying is those commands were not forever. It was not forever. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, I was talking to another uh, Hebrew Israelite, and he said, they said to me, he said, the law was perpetual. It meant forever. He said, what are you going, how are you going to answer that? I said, in the fullness of time. <laughs> in the fullness of time, God sent forth his own son, born of a virgin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To redeem us from underneath the law. Mm -hmm. it, it, until Christ came, they had the law. But when Christ came, end of the law. I'm free. I'm free from the curse of the law. Amen. Last scripture in Hebrews chapter number nine. Hebrews nine. Hebrews nine. Very profound text. We start at verse number 11. Uh -huh. But when Christ appears as a high priest of good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that he is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats, calves, or by means of his, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. 
For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of, uh, uh, of the defiled person, of which is the ashes of a heifer, sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the true and living God. That's nowhere in the law, but it's only guaranteed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, because that sacrificial system of the Old Testament serves as a background <laughs> for once for all sacrifice that Christ gave. That once he gave it, once and for all, everything else was dismissed. Mm -hmm. Brother Goat, Sister Goat, <laughs> Baby Goat, Brother Sister Lamb, Baby Lamb, y'all can all go on back to the house and enjoy your future. Mm -hmm. We don't need you for sacrifices anymore because it did not take away your sins. That's why Hebrews 9 is so powerful. And it's unique because, uh, you know, Jesus was a high priest according to God mm -hmm. because the high priest came out of the, uh, out of the Levitical priesthood, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus comes out of Judah. Mm -hmm. Nobody spoke of him at the altar. Wow. That's some heavy material. Question for you. Yes, sir. If if you could keep the law perfectly, perfectly, would you need mercy? Yes, sir. You still need it. You would? Yes, sir. If you could keep it perfectly, you still need Jesus. Because God has set him forth to be the propitiation for us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. But that sounds like I couldn't Keep it okay. Maybe I'm asking it wrong. I don't. If if a person kept the law 100 percent perfect, they still need Jesus. Cause I just don't see them keeping it 100. percent Maybe no, that's why. No, they can't nobody do it. Right, and and I guess okay. We know that he's our advocate. Right. So again, we don't get that with the law. With the law. So if he's a advocate. You can't just take and tell me that, well, things is done away with it because the only one you understand that cover you in that is Jesus Christ. So because the law wouldn't wouldn't do it because it, it never done it. It never done it. So he's the advocate for 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 our sins. Because the law was for the lawless. Yeah. 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 And righteousness is for those who seek and better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, and I guess, Elder, what I'm saying is maybe I'm, I'm not explaining it right. And, and maybe maybe... I'm thinking of it in the terms of the court. And they say, how do they say, throw yourself on the mercy of the court? Well, most of the time when folks go to the court because they didn't do something. That's the only reason you're there. Right, right. You're not there so, because everything is good. It's there because it's bad. Right. So if if I'm not wrong, why am I throwing myself on the mercy? And you know, and here's the thing about the, the court. Uh, the late Bishop Nehemiah Smith, uh, gospel preacher, he was saying that he was in court one day and he had a ticket and he was guilty uh -huh. and he stood before the judge. The judge says, uh, were you speeding? He said, yes, your honor. Uh, why are you here? I was just here uh, for mercy. And she said, you know what I'm going to do for you today? I'm going to justify you. Uh -huh. He says, I've read about that, but what does that mean here? Uh -huh. She says, I'm going to excuse you from every wrong that pertains to this case, mm -hmm. and I'm going to declare you right now innocent. Mm -hmm. You're free to go. You can, walk, you can walk out to court right now, case dismissed. Mm -hmm. That's justified. Nice. In our court system, mm -hmm. that's what it means. Mm -hmm. She told him, you've been justified, mm -hmm. declared innocent. Isn't that something? Right. And that's what Jesus does for us. That's what he does for us. Right. He right. declares us right. innocent of everything that the law has against us. Mm -hmm. And the law brings some mighty charges against us. Right. And that's why, I, now I think I'm back home now, because they want to say the law plus or the law and. Right. No, it, it, and that's why, where I was coming from right. when I say, well, if, if you keeping the law perfectly, you don't need the, the and Christ. Right. If you... <laughs> you know, the, the Bible said the angels desire mm -hmm. to see 
what we see Woo. and to hear what we have mm -hmm. and, to, and to receive what we got. Mm -hmm. But they can't. You have to be in the flesh. You have to be a human being. You have to. To enjoy the benefits of being called the redeemed ones. Enjoy the benefits. I like that. <laughs> it's a benefit Amen. of serving Jesus. Yes. Friends benefit. There's a lot of benefits. So, so nobody can come and say, uh, hey, they didn't keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. they, all they Christian life, they never kept the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Come right on in. Mm -hmm. Let Robert in. Let, let Robert's in. Let's mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. Bring them on in. And God blesses us, right? That's right. That's, That's all right. he does. <laughs> nothing, you can, nothing you have to do special. Mm -hmm. It is just enjoying the privilege of being redeemed mm -hmm. by the Lord mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. And I, I, I didn't even get to the word apolutros mm -hmm. um, because that has um, a very powerful, powerful effect. Um upon us um you know not only are you released but you are accepted in mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. one part of it is release but you're just not just released mm -hmm. because you don't belong to yourself mm -hmm. remember remember here's the narrative behind um what is called apolutros remember when the man cleaned his house of all them big devils uh-huh and swept, swept his house clean yeah. and did nothing after that. <laughs> and the devil said, oh, he didn't replace nothing. Let's go back. And he brought seven more with him. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. So what God does when he rids us of our former life, rids of, our, of us our sin, he fills us with his Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and takes us in and adopts us as his sons. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be adopted yeah. into God's family, right? Mm -hmm. There's a special privilege in eternity for those who belong to Christ. You know what they're called? Mm -hmm. They're called the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be known as the bride of Christ. Amen. So, Elder, so, so uh, um, that goes along with our lesson earlier today. Uh, uh, but so, so, and by him uh, filling us, then that's how come we know that um, Satan can't live in us. No, sir. Right, because we feel. We feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have uh, situations and circumstances? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are we weak and beggarly sometimes? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But God gives us strength from Amen. day to day. Amen. You know, yes. I told one of my Muslim brothers, he said, why are you a Christian? Why are you still reading that Bible? I said, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I said in Book of Lamentations, I think it's chapter number three, uh, it says that God is faithful. Mm -hmm. And every morning when I wake up, I get brand new mercies. Mm -hmm. Yesterday's gone. I can't do nothing with it. That's right. But what God does for me today is I get brand new mercies. Mm -hmm. Who else, what other religion is guaranteeing me that? <laughs> That every morning I wake up, I get brand new mercies. None. I pray that something to say today to help you and to bless you as we move mm -hmm. toward. Can we close in prayer? Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you, God, for all of our listeners today, and we thank you for uh, the home of our, our dear elder and his lovely wife, God. We pray now your richest blessings, God, that it ever be upon them, in them, and through them, God. We pray, God, that your ministry and angels, God, would ever yes. abide and hover over God and protect them, God, for even every uh, seen and unseen danger. And then, oh God, we pray, God, that your blessings would overtake them and flow in and through them. God, anoint him with more wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Thank you for his faithfulness to the word and even to doing these broadcasts, God. And we thank you for the opportunity of sharing with your people That's today. Right. And we give you honor and the praise. And we pray, God, that you will bless all those who have listened today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, amen. we're going to sign off. And uh, you all just, uh, you, it'll be out there for you to go back. And like I'm going to do, I'm going to go back and regleam again. Right. Again with my notepad and pen, and uh, 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 let us know because I know y'all gonna want uh, Elder Greg. So I'm saying it right here, y'all gonna want him to come back again and tune in um, 
the day Tuesday, uh, Thursday and Friday, where well, um, uh, Minister Andrew and myself will be on, and uh, uh, we'll be, I don't know what the lesson going to be, but it will be biblical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God, so God bless everybody. God Thanks bless. again, Elder. Bless you. Mm -hmm.